Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Part of our continuing series on political division in America, where we interview professors, lawyers, scholars, thinkers, so that you can have an informed opinion as a member of the public about what people are thinking about this going on right now. Well, let's get right to it. Uh, for today, we have Chris Habels Gray. He's not currently a professor. He was formerly a professor. Uh, he's written the book Cyborg Citizen and Modified, Living as a Cyborg. Um, he was a lecturer at California State University in Monterey from 2011 to 2015. He was a visiting professor at the University of College Cork in Ireland in 2014. He was a professor for Goddard College and then the Union Institute and University. He was also an associate professor of computer science, cultural studies of science and technology at University of Greater Falls, assistant professor at the history department of Oregon State, and a guest professor, faculty of information informatics at Marsoc University in 1995. He holds a doctorate of philosophy, uh, history of consciousness, board of studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's been a lecturer, like we said, at the University of Santa Cruz for many years. He's also been an adjunct professor at, New at a New York University online and another adjunct professor at California State University, Monterey. He earned his Bachelor of Arts with a degree in inter interdepartmental major human values and social change from Stanford University in 1975. He earned his Doctor of Philosophy in the History of Consciousness at the University of California at Santa Cruz in 1991 with the dissertation, Computers as Weapons and Metaphors, the U.S. Military, 1940 to 1990 and Postmodern War. He is a professor and core faculty, interdisciplinary studies at Graduate College, the Union Institute, lecturer at Crown College, University of Santa Cruz, lecturer of Humanities, Communications, California State University, Monterey Bay. Uh, professor, did I get anything wrong uh, with your introductions, is there something you'd like to clean up, sir? I know that's pretty, pretty good. Um, I'm not currently teaching anywhere because I've taken time off to write some books and other stuff, but you certainly covered all my academic appointments well. You're not currently a professor now because you've taken some time to write some books and stuff, but we really appreciate it. Uh, now, originally, I had found you from this interview. Should California secede from the United States, an interview with Chris Habels Gray by Hank Pellissier. And this is the quote that got me. Why would California thrive if it seceded from the USA? What is your motivation for wanting this, Dr. Gray? The United States as we know it will not last forever. In the long term, I am working towards an autonomous California that would be part of an American North Union, not unlike the European Union, but with as much less bureaucracy, and most of the power at the local level. Empire is the enemy of democracy, and as long as the U.S. is an empire, we will see our democracy erode. California, Alta, as more in common, economically and culturally with California Baja than Alabama. Professor, recently we saw Marjorie Taylor Greene say that political divisions between red and blue states conservatives and liberals is too big and we need to split because America is too large and we can't see eye to eye together. Were you somewhat saying something similar many, many, many years ago? Cities and counties and so on. Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene is not the brightest um, <laughs> bulb in the uh, array of lights, but uh, she's right that America is very big and has many different um, perspectives and many different cultures within it. And we might all be well served by having uh, more power uh, devolved to more local level. Um, I'm not sure her motivations are the same as mine because she's trying to defend a declining, racist, um, reactionary part of the United States, which is the weakest it's ever been, while we're interested in moving forward and giving people more choices, having more diversity, having more freedom. But 
Uh, she's not entirely wrong. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that once you get really large in terms of your policy, your political unit, it's very hard to have multiple democratic uh, uh, functions. It's just a reality. I mean, look at how many people each congressperson represents now. Look at how hard it is to get the powers that be to even notice uh, what individual things. The big corporations and the super rich, they are the only voices that can be heard in a country of over 400 million. You had said in your piece that California has more in common with Baja California than it does Alabama. Um, certainly your motivations are very different from Marjorie Taylor Greene's, but she was also pointing to the fact that, you know, Southerners don't have a lot in common with New Yorkers and West Coast people. Were you somewhat noticing similar veins in your observation that perhaps the country's too large and our regional cultures are just too different from one another to keep a cohesive whole. Is that a fair statement? Well, I don't know if uh, they're so different we can keep a co uh, cohesive uh, political uh, unit together because a lot of things do knit the country together, especially empire. We all share the empire, the military, the big corporations that work within the country and dominate it in many respects. Uh, the Constitution we share. But when you think about it, of course, the South isn't like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, there's many African Americans live in the South. But having spent some time in the South, I know that they're much more religious African Americans in the South are than African Americans in California are. Although there's Southern Baptists and very religious people in California as well. Um, in general, you can look at each of the states and notice some similarities, even though, of course, within Alabama, there are profound differences between uh, the white racist uh, dominant groups and the uh, rest of the people who live in Alabama who aren't that way. But see, Alabama is more like uh, more of the country was back in the 50s and 60s. The whole country, even Alabama, is moving towards more diversity, moving towards more tolerance, accepting gays, supporting abortion, and so on. But some parts of the country lag very far behind others. And California, New York, for example, and New England and some of the other places, the Northwest, are much more liberal. And, interestingly enough, it's those parts of the country that contribute the wealth that help support places like Alabama that, in fact, is a net importer of federal money. California is exploited by people um, like Georgia, where much with Green is from, uh, Georgia and in from Alabama take money from the United, from California, New York, and then they whine about how they don't like it. Well, uh, I've heard enough of this. I'm perfectly fine that they can just go off on their own. Oh, really, somebody that's what I think. You know, it's bad enough that we have to support them, pay for their freeway, pay for their military bases, and so on. But do we also have to take their insults, the stupid, idiotic insults. I don't know. It doesn't seem right. Good point. Well, let me let me ask you then, because um, you're you're already starting to get to that. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and I get it. You're not a fan. Maybe she's not the best speaker for this. Maybe she's crazy. But is what she's saying real? When she came out on President's Day and made a call for, I'm sorry, when she came out on President's Day and made a call for national divorce, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and said, you know, we should separate. A lot of the response from the media on the left and the right, conservative news and liberal news, said the same thing. There's no division in America. We basically all agree. She's just making political division. I don't know if I really heard that, but if, if, if anyone who thinks that is, is very unfamiliar with the history of this country and is uh, not really paying attention to the current situation. America has always been divided from its very founding when you had Europeans coming in and genociding the indigenous Americans and the indigenous Americans who were here were often at war with each other and actually many tribes to this day do not like each other very much. Right. Of course, when the um, people came from Europe, Spanish settled parts of it, like my ancestors helped settle California, Spanish and Catalan and they went to Florida, and then Protestants settled big parts of it, and Catholic 
not just the French in New Orleans, but Maryland was founded by Lord Baltimore, a Catholic. So then there were divisions. And then we had the American Revolution, where perhaps roughly a third of the people supported independence, uh, maybe less, maybe 10 or 15 percent, I mean, enough to fight. And a less equal proportion supported staying loyal to the uh, British Empire. And most of the people just tried to stay out of the way. Profound differences. Then, um, Still, much of the leadership of the country was very secular. And then there was a big religious revival. It's called the Great Awakening. And more and more, the country realized they had profound differences over the question of slavery. And there was a little thing we call the Civil War, the bloodiest conflict in American history, where at least 600,000 Americans died to um, remove the stain of outright obvious slavery uh, from our country. And that was a bit of a condition. And then after that, of course, uh, racism continued, so you had those decisions, genocide of Indians continued, um, people were discriminated against for being Catholic, like my ancestors when the Anglos took over California, um, Catholics were persecuted and Indians were hunted. Not that the Spanish Empire was good for the natives by like California, but they did not try to genocide them as the Anglos did with the king. And it goes on through the great struggles of the populace and, and workers, you even had the right to strike in World War One, where people who opposed America, or anyway, that war was thrown in jail, and you seen death threat for president from jail, so we know that is possible, that Trump, uh, you know, ends up there, as he should, as he wants to die, and things continued. I'm old enough to remember back in the 60s and 70s, when this country was at least as divided as it is now. But the mm. thing that gets this Green's panties in a twist is that in the 60s, the country was two thirds racist, white dominated, anti women, abortion outlawed, and so on. And now it's only one third that way. This is why we see the right wing becoming more violent, or we see the Republicans directly attacking the, the rule of law and the very political institutions they profess to defend, like the Constitution, because they're losing. They're in the decline, and there's nothing more dangerous than a rabid, racist animal crap and seeing that it's doomed, that its future is over. Even Georgia and Alabama in 30 or 40 years would not be red states. They will be liberal. The demographics say this. So the Republicans are hurrying this along by trying to outlaw abortion, which is alienating young people, by refusing to control horrible weapons. There's been 148 mass shootings this year. So... The country's always been divided. Uh, any, even villages are divided. I don't know if anyone but even families are divided. Sure. I mean, real people, humans, would disagree. Uh, so yeah. division is nothing new. Okay. Uh, what's really new, the newest part of this, is that, in fact, liberal ideas and even radical ideas, more justice for working people, you know, uh, having um, a country that treats women and people uh, who aren't white equally, uh, this is now the dominant viewpoint. That's what's new. And so we're going to see the right wing, you know, be more um, dangerous and uh, certain kind of Trumpy and throwing themselves around, whining, whining, whining. Boy, they whine a lot, kind of way. But anyone who thinks this country hasn't always been divided doesn't know history, and certainly they haven't lived 69 years like I have, or if they did, Fair. they were not paying attention. Let me let me let me let me, re let me reframe the question then. I think you said that America is at least as politically divided as it was since the 1960s. I, I think that was something you said recently. Um, would you say that at least political division has increased since the 90s? That, you know, maybe we had a high point in the 60s, we got through it. But looking at just the last 10 years, 20 years, can you say we've become more divided than we were 20 years ago? Or, you know, has everything been fine? And was paying attention to many of the injustices, which now, for example, was the way police murder people, not just African-American young men, but they certainly killed that at the highest rate other than American Indians. But certain things became obvious and people protested. But what we're really seeing is this desperation of the right wing. And so they're saying things and doing things and, and showing nakedly that they don't believe in democracy, which they never did. Uh, but before, they could pretend to believe in democracy because all their attempts to repress the vote and gerrymander districts and so on, and we're working pretty much. But now it's reached the point that even with the most extreme gerrymandering, like in a state like Tennessee, with 75% of the legislators are Republicans, and they only get like barely over 50% of the vote. I mean, that's not democratic. 
Uh, so now, now we see a right wing that's gotten hysterical because they're losing. And so that makes some uh, people who are in the political scene, who are always looking for balance and so on, think, oh, there's more division. But I can assure you, as an anarchist feminist who's trying to um, get America out of the imperialism business and trying to get the corporations out of controlling what little of our democracy is left, that it's been, and, and someone who's always noted the racism and, no, and so on, and the misogyny, that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's divided as ever. But this pushback, and the fact that the Republicans have seized the judiciary, allowing them to uh, try to abolish abortion, which is supported by over 60% of, the, uh, of Americans, and actually right, certain rights of for raped women and for health reasons, it's much higher than that. Um, that has made it seem to some uncareful observer that there's more divisiveness. But in my life, I've not noticed any change. Um, when the United States invaded Iraq based on a bunch of lies that George Bush and Hillary Clinton agreed upon, the Saddam Hussein, the mass weapons of destruction, there was the biggest protest in the history of the country. The New York Times said the peace movement was the third uh, superpower in the world. I went to a demonstration of over a million people in New York protesting an aggressive war by the United States. That sounds pretty divisive to me. We had this imperial war based on lies, and millions of Americans took to the street. Um, so that's it's not, it's not new. And I don't think the 90s were that great either uh, in terms of unity. Unity is a false goal anyway. The goal's got to be justice. The goal's got to be a sustainable environment. The goal's got to be profit out of determining uh, how our society is run and profit not poisoning the earth and the air and the water like it is. That's what has to happen. And there are going to be people, the super rich and reactionary people and frightening racists who are not going to like it. But uh, otherwise, we're not going to make it. Not just here in the U.S. I would like to... a lot more devices. Uh, if I may, let me run some statistics by you, if I could. And I wanted to get your opinion on these. So, uh, Zogby Strategies is a polling group. In 2017, they found that 39% of Americans across the board felt that secession of their country is um acceptable um a national divorce is largely unpopular with the public one in five oppose it however uh here we go brightline watch did a survey in 2021 and it showed 47 percent of democrats supported west coast secession and 66 percent yeah 66 percent of republicans supported uh southern secession um there's the map there we also have a poll from 2021 that shows 80% of Biden voters and 84% of Trump voters feel elected officials from the other party are a clear and present danger to America. 74% of Biden voters and 78% of Biden of Trump voters feel people, voters, fellow Americans from the other party are a clear and present danger to America. We also have National Public Radio talking about a book called The Big Sort in 2008 and 2022, where they're saying Americans are largely segregating themselves into like-minded political communities. And finally, we have the New York Times article that says that the counties that have gone from competitive to landslide has shifted. So if you go back to 1992, half the country was counties where you could run as a Republican or Democrat, and he had a 50-50 chance winning. That's almost completely wiped out. And now most of the country is hardcore red or hardcore blue with no chance. So in 20 years, we've gone from half of the country was competitive uh, and not polarized to just about 10%. Um, thoughts, feelings on these metrics, Professor? Well, some of those things just reflect I mean, real dynamic. Um, while I was saying the country was pretty um, incredibly divided all through its history, but thanks to um, various factors like people moving and the sorting that has taken place, um, now we see some regions have become more pure in their perspective than others. Although, if you look at the Civil War, for example, um, abolitionism was 
profoundly strong in some areas, and slavery um, beliefs were really strong in others. This is why we have West Virginia, but those parts of Virginia that didn't have rich enough white people to have slaves, they left to join the Union and fight against the slave states. So now we have seen that story. And we've seen that the Republicans have become desperate, they gerrymandered to an extraordinary degree, creating these super legislative districts, right? While the Democrats have tried that sometimes, but much to their credit, they've also supported um, having fair uh, and balanced electoral districts in California. It's not gerrymandered, but we still have this sorting happening. That doesn't mean there's um, less diversity among people. It means they're living more with the people they're comfortable with, which is, I don't know if that's really a bad thing, uh, necessarily. But it does reflect that, you know, people have different values. Um, but the bigger picture, um, you can see that, in fact, certain right-wing reactionary values are declining. Now, this um, disagreement with the two parties, it's an interesting statistic because, you know, the biggest party in America is independent. It's people who think Republicans and Democrans are both sort of fucked up. That's certainly me, although I usually vote Democrat. Uh, but there's two wings to the Democratic Party. There's a corporate Democratic wing, and then there's a progressive wing. Now, much of its history, the Democratic, its recent history, of course, it's a medium level history, the Democrats of the slave party. And its early history, the Democrats were profoundly radical populist party of Thomas sure. Jefferson, who actually thought of, of the seedings of the United States when the Federalists were trying to destroy the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. So this idea of leaving, of moving, it used to be you could, you could just leave your state and go west and maybe steal land from the Indians, but you could have a certain amount of freedom. Well, that option is no longer here. And many historians and, and other philosophers have noticed how that's affected the American view of the world. Now that many more people are open to secession, or maybe breaking up the United States, I think it's a good thing that the Republicans think that they can get Tejas, Texas, separate, and they can run their little insane asylum, or, uh, like Abbott's running it now. But they're just stupid. They aren't even paying attention to the demographics and even what the young white kids are thinking about what Republicans want. But yes, I'm very happy to hear that uh, people on the West Coast more and more are sick and tired of the craziness and reactionary views of right-wing people, and they're whining, the constant pathetic whining. It's really almost as bad as their policy. Places like Hawaii, only recently taken over by the U.S. Empire in 1898, there's very strong interest in independence there, and that some right-wingers support independence that actually opens the door for a constitutional amendment allowing for a peaceful option for the states renegotiating their relationship to the federal government. So I'm actually um, happy to even to see the delusions of right-wing people who think that they will be able to get their little racist, fundamentalist, Christian, of uh, Jesus wants to kill you kind of Christianity that makes no sense to me. Um, and that because they will think that, yes, if we have a constitutional amendment, that they will be able to set up their little theocracy, and California can go its own way, and they are paying attention to who's paying a lot of their bills. But in the long run, I think it's not impossible that within 30 or 40 years there will be a peaceful transition, maybe sooner, that will allow the United States to become more like a confederation, like Europe is, but without some of the problems of the EU. You know, I'm old enough, the thought of having a united Europe, of going across these borders and having the same money and, and so on, and this, this was seen as impossible when I was first in Europe, right. when I was 19, which I came around, right. and now I'm in Spain, and this is how they live. This, the pace of political change in the world is extremely fast, in part because the pace of technological and scientific change is extremely fast for human society now. So people will see things that they did not think was possible very soon, maybe even the collapse of the biggest empire in the history of the world, because just a few years ago, in 1989, we saw the second biggest empire in the history of the world That's right. uh, collapse. That's right. Well, let me ask you. So this can happen. Right. Uh, So one of the things I noticed was NPR was saying that people were moving to politically like-minded communities and they were turning it more hard. I'm sorry. NPR was saying that people were moving to politically like-minded communities and that's what was turning them red and blue. Not, I mean, there was some gerrymandering, but according to NPR and the big sort, it's mostly people moving 
not necessarily the Republicans rigging elections, although they have been making a lot of efforts recently. We're looking at trends going back to the uh, 1990s. The other thing I wanted to ask was the Wall Street Journal had an article in November 10th, 2020, how politics has pulled the country in different directions. And they look at ideology among party identifiers, Republicans and Democrats, going back to 1974. In 1974, only 45 percent of Republicans identified as hardcore conservative. In 2016, it was 76 percent. So 46, 45 percent to 76 percent since 1974. Democrats, only 28 percent consider themselves hardcore liberal. In 2016, it was 59 percent. So the Republicans have gone from 45 percent to 76 percent and the democrats have gone from 28 percent to 59 percent almost polarizing themselves by over 100 percent in both parties and going back to 1974. wouldn't that show that there is some definitive increase in political division in america no because one thing you're leaving out is that uh both parties have had Bye. as much trouble with liberals as I think conservatives, reactionary fascists, though, no, that was the heavy one. But, you know, real conservative people have many virtues. As an anarchist, I like to conserve nature. As Republicans, who was environmentalist. I used to, I worked for Republicans. Pete McCloskey ran against Nixon as a pro-environment, anti-war Republican, and I walked this big for him. Even recently, I voted for the lieutenant governor candidate, Mel Leonardo, who ran against uh, Gavin Newsom, who I consider a slime ball. You work I mean, for Abel Maldonado? Maldonado? Nice. I know yes. that guy. Well, yes, thank well, you. I, thank you. Oh, you do know him? I would like to meet him because I thought he was a good candidate. And, and you know, he refused to hold the California budget hostage, as the other Republicans did. So, yes, it's a shame that the parties, especially the Republicans, have become less and less democratic and, and univocal. Your statistics show this works with them. But you also... Many people who vote Democrat and even people who are the progressive part of the Democrats. I don't know if AOC would call herself a liberal, really. I suspect she's actually a radical. Um, certainly her policies are radical. Elizabeth Warren's policies are radical. Many of the people I respect most in Congress and in uh, other local elected positions are radical. In my little town of Santa Cruz, the struggle is between radicals and liberals who will control this town, right? And uh, conservatives have no say, and reactionaries, you know, they pretty much keep their mouths shut, uh, except that they're up at the mountains doing nothing stuff, which you still see a fair amount of that. So um, I don't think there's any other, but the parties are more uh, alienated from each other. And we're seeing uh, as the right wing point of view in the United States becomes more and more a minority position, that those people are becoming particularly desperate. And hypocritical, too, if you look at Trump and think he's supposed to represent these old Republican values of family and honor and respect the law, um, it's just a sure. joke. Sure, sure. There's something about Republicans see things, which is very sad. I mean, Democrats can be very hypocritical and very corrupt, too. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the Republicans have set new standards for hypocrisy and uh, anti-democratic behavior that we haven't seen since... Civil War, sure, sure. But let me let me zero in on, on something, though. This chart shows liberals, leftists, Democrats, people, not Republicans, however you want to call it, increasing their polarization by about 100 percent from 1974 to uh, 2016. Uh, let me see if I can increase the size of the chart. Uh, I'll see percentage of Democratic identity as liberal. Let's see, it's Democrat, percentage of Democrats and Republicans. But maybe maybe there is uh, polarization. And you know what could cause that polarization is that more and more people, I mean, I'm willing to admit that maybe, uh, maybe more people are not in the middle. More people, especially working people, realize the country is not working for them. And if you're a racist, fundamentally, or if you've been betrayed by someone like Obama, who betrayed all, all sorts of people who own houses, when he agreed to bail out the banks and not bail out the people who've been screwed over by the banks in 2008, you know, in all those counties, a certain percentage 
of white homeowners lost their houses because of this Obama policy. They flipped from going for Obama to going for Trump. The margin of Trump's victory was Obama's betrayal of working class people and uh, turning over money, just giving, giving massive amounts of money to the banks, but not to working people, not to real people, white or black, because that would be, as the economists say, moral hazard. So we see anyone who, it's harder and harder to pretend the world isn't going deep into crisis. You could probably throw up a nice chart there that shows that the percentage of wealth held in the United States goes more and more to a smaller group of people. Now, if you're racist, if you're afraid, if you believe you're a in fundamentalist Christianity that is very anti-peace, anti-Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, anti-helping your brothers and sisters in need, then you will go to the right because you see the world in crisis. And you will deal with the realities of climate change and pandemics driven by globalization, not not evil, global, not driven by conspiracies by Jewish bankers, as the addicts of that uh, the Republicans would say, but driven by the reality that more and more wild land is being taken up and more and more xenoviruses uh, are coming into the human uh, population. So if you don't, if you notice that and you want to deny it because it doesn't fit your worldview, you, you become a reactionary. And if you notice this and you believe in science and you believe in tolerance and whether you're Christian or not, you believe in loving and helping your neighbors as much as possible, then you become more polarized too and become radical. So we're seeing the progressive wing of the Democratic Party become stronger, and we see that in the streets it's anarchists and feminists and anti-racist activists and environmentalists willing to confront the powers that be, the super wealthy, that have more and more power in the streets, along with the super right wing, scaredy cat men who can't get laid, the incels and, and the others um, who are trying to um, keep uh, a path that never was alive. So yes, there might be polarization, and if there is polarization, I would say it's because the crisis humanity is in around the world is deepening. And uh, right-wing people, people who fundamentally are racist, who never thought Obama was really president, but how could the black man be president, those people go in one direction, and many are working people, so to say, and then are people who uh, have more open hearts and believe in, uh, in uh, loving their neighbors, they go in another direction. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is more ubiquitous, not just in the United States and throughout the world. Certainly there's more of a realization that the world's in crisis. And old, moderate, of both sides might be right. Let's just keep the American Empire going and the, and the money flowing to the military industrial complex, which we were warned about by a Republican, by the way. I, I, I yeah. Yeah, I remember. I want to cover a statistic that absolutely, I'm sorry. I remember that uh, you're talking about Ike and the military industrial complex. He was a Republican and he was a patriot. But I wanted to point out a statistic that completely backs up what you're saying. It's by Norman Ornstein. And he says uh, in 2018, he said, I want to repeat a statistic I use in every talk. By 2040 or so, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states, meaning 30% of Americans will choose 70 senators, and that 30% of Americans will be older, whiter, more rural, and more male than the other 70%. He's talking exactly about what you're saying, that people are moving to these metro areas, the interior of the country is becoming old, white, not diverse, and totally just Fox News watching. And they're becoming more polarized, and it's going to get worse all the way up into the year 2040. Yes, the election policy is what we have from the great compromise of sex slavery alive, which Benjamin Franklin said was his biggest mistake supporting that compromise, is one of the biggest threats to democracy. A person in Wyoming who votes for president, their votes were 3,000 times. As your vote or my vote in California. Yes, Professor. Republicans Absolutely. would not have won the presidency um, for, for 30 years if their electoral college wasn't there. So this is another reason we have to either have a fundamental reform of that or actually break the U.S. up. It's not democratic. And it threatens our very future because some of these policies the Republicans put forward, as we can see, are just profoundly dangerous for the environment and for our future. I want to ask you another question, if I can. Um, one second. So recently, I'm sorry. 
I keep forgetting this. I want to ask you one more question if I can. So recently, let me show this to the audience. Joseph Biden was president, a liberal, a Democrat, whatever you want to call it. And he gave a speech in, uh, in front of a blood red backdrop with two active duty Marines where he seemed to call 78 million Americans enemies of the state. It was so polarizing that independents and even Democrats in his own party said, wow, bad idea. That just caused political division. That's not a Republican. Well, he's the president. He has Marines around him all the time. I, I don't. I, I'm glad Biden is definitely more um, willing to confront evil than Obama was. Uh, he's a good liberal, and he brings our presidency a lot of the liberal values that Clinton, uh, the one who was elected and the one who wasn't, but Clinton did not have, believing in this kind of triangulation as they called it, and but Obama just have being so incredibly conciliatory and. They really in the pocket of uh, of the banks and the people who support the bank. So uh, I can't believe anyone would accuse Biden of causing division after we've had eight years of Trump running for president and being president, where every day he did ten times worse. This is just the most ridiculous both sides of which the mainstream media is so prone to. Now, personally. You know, I think Biden's too old. I'd rather have somebody like uh, um, even Kamala Harris, who many of my friends are fond of, and you're in San Francisco. She wasn't a great district attorney, but she was a slightly better attorney general of the state, and then she was even a better senator. So I like her trajectory. She becomes more liberal. She becomes better. I prefer Elizabeth Warren. I prefer AOC, which my sons would. Well, they well, both think she would be the one to be president. Well, let me ask you about AOC. Um, if, if I may. So, uh, well, just to, just to point out, a lot of Democrats did say Joseph Biden's speech was divisive, and a lot of independents did. That's a fact. Additionally, presidents don't normally give speeches with active duty military, and presidents historically have never called 78 million Americans enemies of the state. If we look at AOC, she also suggested that after Republicans are gone, we should start keeping lists of everybody who's there who doesn't uh, so we can make sure they're not employed. Those are both strategies. Okay. Do you want to keep lists of who? All Republicans, so that they can make sure they're never well, employed all Republicans again. Republicans already on list. There are voter rolls of public. You right. want to make lists up. Th this would and be. I don't care what a lot of Democrats say. A lot of Democrats are uh, corporate and uh, or they're liberal. Okay. And Biden is far from perfect. Uh, how many of these Democrats criticize him? For opening up Alaska and offshore and other places, their oil drilling. I'm, I'm unimpressed by these arguments. Uh, all <laughs> fair, but I'm, I mean, my. Gave a five, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, my, my only question is could these also be examples of political division? Let's make lists of everybody on the political party to punish them for the rest of their life. And let's call out everybody on the political party as an enemy of state. These were things the Nazis did. Now, I'm not disagreeing that the Republicans are a little bit racist and bad, but. These are straight up examples the Nazis did caused political polarization. Can we actually look at these and say they have nothing to do with polarization and let's just ignore them? Is that actually fair? No, no, of course they have everything to do with polarization. I just don't think they're anything new. I mean, back in the 50s, there were uh, enemies lists and um, the people were hunted and thrown out of their jobs. Uh, and actually there's been a lot of throwing people out of their jobs by Republicans lately. You don't have to be examples of that. But uh, like I said, I'm not a Democrat. I don't have to defend what the Democrats. Oh, sure, you sure. You bring me some criticisms of anarchists, and I will tell you, well, there's a lot of asshole anarchists, and I'm against what they did. Sure. But uh, as far as the Democrats go, um, you know, there's, there's great Democrats like AOC, and there's others who are doing okay, like Biden, and there's many of them, like Manchin, and, and many more who are more subtle, who are totally in the pockets of the corporations. So it's complicated. But uh, these things are signs of how um, divisive or how polarized or how different people view politics in America, which I still say is not anything new. Um, they aren't causing it. Biden standing there in front of two Marines is not causing it. And I can think back to all sorts of press conferences on the fly in front of uh, the Marine One, the helicopter, and 
George Bush on the kick declaring victory and stuff, I'm not quite so sure that uh, presidents have been so um, careful not to uh, have the trappings of uh, military power. Sure, but... but, as far but as said, well, but if I may, if I may... power to Biden. The more, he's, the more he does stuff like this and gets people all upset, the better. It's when he starts trying to be centrist, like by um, bowing down to the oil companies as he has recently, which is costing him a lot of support among young people. So the climate change happens to be real. I, I, I believe it's real too, but if I could, if I could, there has not been a president ever who did a uh, planned speech. You're right. Presidents stand in front of helicopters and, and aircraft carriers, but nobody's done a planned speech in front of like the White House or Congress with a blood red backdrop and active duty Marines. That hasn't happened. Secondly, no president has done a national address calling out the other half of the country as enemies of the state. That Those are two new things. Additionally, as you have just said, not we have not even when Lincoln went to war against the South. He didn't even say they were enemies of the state. He made them enemies of the state, and he killed hundreds of thousands of them. Well, yeah, fair, I'm not sure. I'm fair, I'm, I, I, I fair. I'm not internet wealthy, but even if Biden did this, I don't care compared to okay. what Trump has done. It's nothing. It's nothing compared to what Trump has done, and this is beneath you. This kind of both sides. Okay, I I would like to point out that. From your own admission, you said last time we saw lists was in the 1950s. Now we're seeing with AOC now. And the last time we saw calling out the other side as enemies of the state was 1860. Now we're seeing it now. Wouldn't that suggest that we're seeing at least some return to highly polarizing politics we haven't seen in half a decade or a full century? Uh, AOC did not call for firing people and arresting people. I, I'm actually not sure what she called for. I will look it up after I talk and see what she actually said. I found that often what she's been accused of saying is not really exactly what she said. And you say keeping lists of Republicans, I'm still confused by this because everyone's party affiliation is public record. So nobody has to go and keep lists. The list exists. And so what did she say? Oh, we should have these lists and not buy stuff from their corporations. Well, we know the best. So I don't know what she what she, I'm trying to pull it up right now. about the rise of Nazism. And so on. You will see you had two authoritarian regimes, the Communist Party and the Nazi Party, who tore Germany apart. And often they allied with each other. I mean, it's very different. Neither the Republicans nor the Democrats are authoritarian parties like the Nazis and the Communists were. You cannot imagine them making some kind of alliance to overthrow democracy, as in fact the KDP, which is the German Communist Party at the time, did with the Nazi Party to overthrow the Senate, which supported democracy. There is nothing like that yet. But we do see a rise of actual fascism and its justification in at least a third of the Republican Party. This is a real threat. We haven't seen this level of fascism since before World War II, when uh, Joseph Kennedy, ambassador to the Court of St. James, and Lindbergh and many other prominent Americans were very pro Hitler, right? Now we are seeing that, but it's nothing like the Weimar Republic and the class of society. You had incredible economic collapse too, which made that kind of division possible. We do not have that either. So I do not see yet that we're in that same situation. But it is, you know, it is concerning to see the right wing uh, become more uh, powerful. Fortunately, the left wing in America, the strong left, the far left, where I am, we don't have a vanguard party, an authoritarian party like the communists. It's anarchists and feminists mainly, and African-American um, local militias and, and activist groups who the churches who are not violent. It's quite a different situation than uh, the German state in the 1930s. Fair, fair. And and we've I've talked to some other professors about political divisions in other countries, and one of the things they said backed up what you said. They just didn't think that we had the ethnic cleavages at the level that other countries had before they entered into a civil war. They didn't see it as basically bad enough between racist whites and others, but they said it could maybe get there. So absolutely backing up what you're saying. Let me ask you another question, if I may. Would federalism improve the situation? Is oh, I'm sorry. Would federalism improve the situation? Would federalism help improve divisions between us, maybe make us come back together? Or is federalism not what's needed? Uh, well, if we had more true federalism, more power locally, as 
but protected by a strong bill of rights. One is afraid what might happen in Georgia and Alabama with the hard rising power because we see what they're trying to do even now. Um, but I think, for one thing, it would end the American empire. And if America didn't have to sustain its empire with a massive military industrial complex, there would be much more wealth for the rest of the country. And the wealth to actually rebuild the country, its infrastructure, and to put in uh, you know, alternative energy and so on. But we do have to worry. Because remember earlier how I was saying that the pace of social and political change is accelerating because of the pace of technological change. Well, we could see in just 10 years, there's two economic collapse. If the pace of climate disaster keeps accelerating like it is, going faster than the scientists even predicted, once, uh, if you're part of my expression, the shit really hits the fan, then we could see the polarization and we could be in a situation like Germany was in 10 or 15 years. It's not impossible because once actual material conditions as they were in Germany after the defeat of World War One and the reparation, the looting of their country by France and Britain especially, put everyone uh, in a horrible situation. If uh, the whole world gets in a horrible situation, then all bets are off. Then all my optimists think it's not so bad, it's, it's, it's meaningless. So that's one of many reasons we have to fight hard to keep the world from reaching that precipice and going over it. And it's mainly ecological at this point. But actually, one nuclear war could really ruin everyone's day. Yeah, and yeah. And in Israel, for example, Israel's been really strange lately and struggling to keep its democracy. We see Pakistan and India, where democracy is under great threat. Those are both nuclear powers who hate each other. Right. We see a proliferation of technologies of mass destruction. Biological weapons are very easy to move. Right. More and more nuclear weapons. We can expect Russia to collapse or we have a supreme crisis as they continue to be defeated by Ukraine. So there's many reasons to be afraid for the world. It's all the more reason for people to step up, work with your neighbors, foster good values, work for more democracy, work against the rich controlling everything, and maybe we will make it through this crisis. Uh, I hope to be live long enough to see it, but I, I don't know. It's going to be a near thing. I, I completely agree with everything you said. Completely agree with everything you just said. The CRISPR technology allows people to do gene editing at a level we've never seen before. It's scary. Um, I believe it was Keynes was the English economist who said, do not make uh, the war reparations after World War I so onerous for Germany or you will create World War II. And finally, I, I study climate change in depth, and you're absolutely right. People in America are not aware that most of the cropland in the South and the Midwest will be gone and unable to support crops in the next 20 to 30 years. I don't think Americans have any idea what we're going to do when we can't grow enough food to feed ourselves. And it's coming because of climate change. Completely agree with you. Yes, and the Central Valley, too, with, with the yes, sir. pumping out of the groundwater and so on. That, that's on the great side. Subsidence. Oh, California, so, you're, so it's so true. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you another question, if I may. When Marjorie Taylor Greene made her statement about we need a national divorce between red and blue, a Utah governor said, we don't need a national divorce. We just need marriage counseling. What does marriage <laughs> counseling? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You get uh, Professor, please enlighten me. What is marriage counseling? for a population of two to three hundred million people look like? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> you have to admire, see, at least in Utah, you still have Republicans with some of those old values, you know, people like Romney. I mean, I have many problems with the Church of Latter-day Saints, <laughs> but I have to say that when they say they're conservative in certain ways, uh, they still hold to those values and they take care of their own and, uh, they are super bad with the environment. I mean, but yes, it's very optimistic. Well, I don't think divorce is allowed for members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, so maybe that's part of it. You know, I've lived with some Mormons, and, you know, they have people come uh, every week to check on them and stuff, so they're very interventionist. Uh, but most Americans believe in divorce. Uh, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene has one or two. And Trump's one. She does, yes, before. yes. Uh, and we can see his next one coming, can't we? But yes, uh, sometimes divorce is the right solution, and then you can stay friends. This is what 
you know, a decentralized United States would be, right? And Alberta can cozy up to North Dakota. They're sort of similar in their politics. But California and Oregon and Washington and D.C. and uh, Baja can all, like, share a lot more as we do uh, with the same ocean and climate and so on. And, and then we can get along better. I think Scotland would get along better with uh, England once Scotland has more independence. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Totally agree with everything you said, Professor. I'm a big Nicola Sturgeon fan. Big Nicola Sturgeon fan. Prime Minister of Scotland. Completely agree with what you said. Um, Well, let me ask you, do you have any last minute statements? Is there any questions you'd like to ask us? Is there a statement that you'd like to leave people with? Or one of my favorite things I always like to ask everybody as a guest Is there something you'd like to leave the audience with that maybe they can't remember this whole interview, but they'll remember this statement and a week from now they'll go, you know what? I I don't remember everything they said, but there was this one thing this professor said. What is that statement you'd like to leave Americans with that's appropriate for this conversation and you hope they'll spend some time thinking about? Well, first let me ask you, um, uh, what do you think about California independence? Have you joined the California National Party or looked into it? I'm very familiar with Theo Slater and uh, Michael Loeb's and all of the founders of the California National Party. In fact, I just talked to Theo Slater, the founder of the California National Party, yesterday. I totally support them. I totally support the idea that economically California would be... No one in California now disagrees with the idea that we couldn't financially make it on our own. Everybody that I've seen knows we could financially do it economically and we'd be just fine. They may have other reasons against it, but what I've seen in the last 10 years is that the debate of could we even survive has gone away. Everybody now knows, yeah, we could totally survive on our own, but would there be this problem or that problem? And I think Good or bad, a lot of that shift had to do with Gavin Newsom calling California a nascent state when Donald Trump was president and saying, we're going to ignore whatever federal regulations come down the pipe for COVID. After that, people started to get real proud about saying um, we're a nation state. And then you started seeing newspapers saying, well, you know, we could survive on our own. Like that's that used to be a question. It's completely gone. I completely agree with that uh, analysis and that evolution. Um, but there's more debate to go. I wonder where it goes from there. But economically, politically, uh, I mean, we ignored the federal government on marijuana. We ignored the federal government on stem cells. We ignored the federal government on on, uh, tailpipe regulations. We love doing our own thing. Our governor went to Latin America two weeks after he was elected and said, consider California as having a separate foreign policy to Latin America from America. And everybody in California was cool with it. The governor before him, Schwarzenegger, traveled around the world, called California a nation state, signed trade deals with other countries, was criticized by George W. Bush for doing that. No one in California cared that he acted like a president. Didn't even raise our radar. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to hear. So what I'd like to leave your audience... Yes, sir. Yes, Professor. Remind them that there are... Uh, many, many more of us, citizens, neighbors, real people, than there are politicians. Mm. There are some politicians who manage to take that role and not become incredible flaming assholes. But it's very difficult. It's really difficult. Pete McCloskey, the Republican who I worked for, he swore he would only be in Congress for two terms. He could not bear to leave it. He could not bear being a, And he was a very admirable person when he started that trajectory. I was spending some time with an Austrian friend of mine who lives in the country in Austria, and she's an anarchist. She supports the Greens and so on. But her neighbors are conservative, and she noticed that they're good people. You could depend on them if there's a problem. And yet the Green Party, which is supposed to foster, you know, um, support for working people and people out in the countryside, there's no way to speak to the people that she lives next door to. Mm -hmm. And this really bothers her. When the big earthquake hit uh, Santa Cruz in 1989, I lived up in the mountains in Ben Lomond, and the local um, captain of the volunteer fire department, he came to my house first. And he said, we got to go door to door and tell people 
but they have to evacuate because the dam was not, uh, the fentanyl the dam wasn't for sure, and it was dangerous. And why did he come to my house? Because I was sent on as the crazy anarchist, and he was very right wing. <laughs> and he figured that between us, everyone would believe one of us. Right. <laughs> that's, the thing. that's people that's coming the thing together. About, yeah. Yes, people have to come together because we are not neighbors. When it comes down to it, we all live on this planet together, and most people are reasonable when you can get past this polarization. And I have to say, whether it's Democratic politicians or Republican politicians or, or patriot militia activists or anarchist feminist activists or African Americans picking up guns to defend themselves, which they have every right to do, um, we have a tendency not to talk to other people. Mm -hmm. And like you actually pointed out, the whole theme of this uh, podcast is about this divisiveness. And yet, when you get down to it, when you meet real people, regular people, your neighbors, you see that we have a lot more in common. And if things get worse, you have to remember that. Reach out to your neighbors, not on some online thing with the most idiotic things people say makes everyone upset, but actually face to face. Because we know if there was trouble, you know, your neighbors would, most of your neighbors, not all, but most of your neighbors would help you and you would help them. And that's what we need. Because that's what it's going to come down to. True solidarity beyond the politicians. Right beyond the super rich, beyond the corporations, which have all the rights of people, but none of the obligations, which is so weird, yeah, and so many weird things in that. I just can't even start. So that's what I would say: uh, not necessarily love your neighbor, but respect your neighbor and work with your neighbor to survive, maybe even thrive. Like you did. You got what I liked is that you're practicing what you preach. You just gave some examples of reaching out to people who you don't share opinions with in order to share information to help the entire neighborhood. And then you're saying, why can't everybody else do that? I, I, I absolutely agree. If we could actually speak with each other on things that we agree with, if we could come together on joint solutions to major problems like war and climate change, I absolutely think things would be a lot better. Completely agree. Uh, any last minute comments, Professor? I really appreciate the interview and I want to thank you for coming out. No, I'm happy with that last comment, but I do appreciate talking with you. I look forward to meeting you in person someday, maybe you're in the city. That would be I awesome. That yeah, absolutely. And I, I, um, I live near Camarillo sometimes, so it's not too far from Santa Cruz, if if I'm not mistaken. All right, great, great. Um, take I, care. Take care. I'm going to send you an email at this interview, and if you would consider anybody else who you know who might be open to having an honors conversation, you don't have to say now. I would ask you an email if there's anybody you would recommend who might be open to this sort of discussion. And I really appreciate your time. Oh, sure. I know lots of people. <laughs> Perfect. I will email you very shortly. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Professor. All right. Take All right. care. Bye. Bye. -bye.